Hi there. Welcome to Pete's Crib, where we guide young minds to heal young lives through case-based discussions. I am Dr. Manyesane, a pediatrician based in East London. If you find value in our content, please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share with peers. And make sure to hit the bell notification so that you don't miss an update. Let's dive in and grow together. In the previous video on the approach to managing a shocked hyperanatomic baby, I promised to provide more examples of hyperosmolar states in pediatrics. Today, I am here to fulfill that promise. If you missed the previous video, I encourage you to watch it first to build a foundational understanding before diving into this one. Our case for today is a six-year-old previously well girl who presented with a three-day history of progressive epigastric abdominal pain associated with polydipsia and secondary nocturnal enuresis. She also had a two-week history of 5 kg weight loss. On initial examination, it was revealed that she was tachypneic with a cosmal breathing, tachycardic with a 10% dehydration. She was hyperglycemic with an HGT of 17 and acidotic with a pH of 7.13 and a bicarb of 3.8. A urine dipstick that was then revealed ketonuria and glucosuria. Assessment of DKA with 10% dehydration in a previously healthy child was made. Now, how do we recognize or suspect DKA in a child? It is important for us to note that DKA in children does not uh, only okay in a pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Actually, in pediatrics, diabetes almost always presents as DKA for the first time. Now, for you to recognize DKA, the patient must have or must present with symptoms of diabetes, like mentioned in my patient. These are examples of polydipsia, where the patient is drinking too much, polyuria, they're passing urine too much, they are nauseous, they are vomiting, they have abdominal pains, and they may actually have decreased level of consciousness. Now, together with these symptoms of diabetes, the patient will also have the following triad for you to make a diagnosis of DKA. So they will have a high HGT, which is hyperglycemia with an HGT of more than 11 millimoles per liter. They will be acidotic with a metabolic acidosis with a pH of less than 7.3 or a bicarb of less than 15 and they will also when you're doing a dipstick have ketonuria and glycosuria so now if you're looking at this criteria here you can safely say that the case that we were given you are now sure that the patient was really in dka because she had the symptoms of diabetes and together with that she had this triad that we just talked about here now you might be asking yourself why do this patient present with the above symptoms or signs please stay with me as I walk you through it in the following slides. Now let's explain the symptoms of diabetes and DKA and how do they come about. So DKA is one of the most common hyperosmolar states in pediatrics following hypernatremia. In this case, it's actually the glucose that is high extracellularly instead of the sodium. And the high glucose then causes osmotic diuresis. And because of this osmotic diuresis, these patients will be poly polyuric. And because this polyuria is usually excessive, they will then get dehydrated. So there's usually three P's that are spoken about in diabetes, which is polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. So now we know how the polyuria comes about. How does the polydipsia comes about? So because they get excessively dehydrated, then they will get thirsty, of course. They will get excessively thirsty. How does the polyphagia comes about, come about? Even though these patients, they actually have hyperglycemia, this hyperglycemia is actually unable to enter into the cells. Why? Because of the deficiency or resistance of insulin in diabetic patients. Remember, in pediatrics, type 1 diabetes is the most common one. So they usually have relative or absolute deficiency of insulin. And that insulin is actually needed 
to push the glucose into the cells. So because now it's deficient, that doesn't happen. Now, how, how does the, what does the body respond to this? So because the body is unable now to convert glucose into energy, because it's not getting any glucose, because glucose is unable to enter the cells. So because it's unable to get energy now, it starts breaking down fat and muscle. And that's why you will find these patients having excessive weight loss, just like in our case, the patient has lost 5 kg in the past two weeks. So that is explained by that. That's why diabetic patients, they get so thin and wasted. Now let's explain the GIT symptoms. Abdominal pain is actually the most common presentation of DKA in pediatrics. Now the, the cause of this abdominal pain is actually unclear, but there has been some theories that have been uh, trialed or explained in literature. The first theory is that the abdominal pain that they have, it's actually associated with the metabolic acidosis than the hyperglycemia that they have. So how does this happen? It has been found that increased hydrogen ions in the blood, they cause inflammation of the gastric mucosa, which will then lead to pain. The other cause of pain in these patients is that because they usually have associated electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemias, low chlorides, and low sodiums, then these have been found to actually cause gastrointestinal muscle spasms, which will then cause um, gastric cramps. And sometimes these patients will have ileus, especially from hyper hypokalemia, which will also contribute to the, to the pain that they will have. Also, hyperglycemia also has been found to increase pressures in the gallbladder and in the bowel duct, which will also contribute to pain. And also, DKA patients have actually been found to have associated increased amylase, which then talks to the pancreas. There is something that is happening with the pancreas. So it has been found that because of the hypoperfusion that they get because of dehydration, they actually get hypoperfusion to the pancreas because of the dehydration that they have. And that hypoperfusion to the pancreas will also uh, contribute to the pain that these patients have. Now let's move to nausea and vomiting. What stimulates this? The excessive ketones that they have. So because these patients, they have ketonemia and ketonuria. So the excessive ketones that they have in the blood, they actually induce the nausea and the vomiting. Now we're going to move to the decreased level of consciousness and the triad of di diabetes um, ketoacidosis. Please stay tuned till the end so that you don't miss this. Now let's move on to why these patients are usually drowsy or have a decreased level of consciousness and then we'll talk about the triad. So one of the things that can actually make them drowsy is a severe dehydration, especially if they are in shock. As I've explained in the previous video, that shock can do make pediatric patients drowsy. And another thing that we need to go back to is the hyperosmolar state that I also spoke about in the previous video and its effect on cerebral edema. So I'm not going to go into details as how the fluids that we give patients that are in a hyperosmolar state contribute to causing cerebral edema. But I will explain the other theories that have been studied in literature that explain the possible causes of cerebral edema in a DKA patient. Patients. Because these patients, sometimes they actually come with the cerebral edema already, even before you start giving them treatment. So how do you suspect cerebral edema clinically? So on top of the fact that they can be drowsy, um, like abnormally drowsy, they can have decreased level of consciousness, they may complain of headaches, vomitings, bradycardias, abnormal breathing patterns. So those are the, some of the signs and symptoms that you may hear on these patients. And they can actually have seizures if the cerebral edema is so severe. So one of the theory that has been um, studied in literature that can explain is associated with the metabolic acidosis that these patients have. As I've discussed that with metabolic acidosis, you usually have a compensatory hypocapnia or a decreased CO2 as a respiratory compensation. So that CO2 can actually cause cerebral vasoconstriction and it will cause ischemia in the brain and then they will have reperfusion injury in response to that ischemia. 
So that is one of the theories that have been postulated, especially on patients that come already with signs and symptoms of cerebral edema. The other theory is that is the role of the sodium hydrogen pump. I'm sure you remember that on the previous video, we talked about the role of the sodium of the potassium and hydrogen pump. Now we're talking about the role of the sodium and, and hydrogen pump. So when you increase the pH, when you drop the acidity of the blood with your fluid resuscitation and all, the normalize the increasing pH doesn't only shift potassium into the cells, just like we've explained in the previous video, but it also causes an influx of sodium into the cell. And we know sodium usually goes with water wherever it goes. And that sodium inside the cell, it also actually stimulates calcium release, which will cause cell death. So sodium entering into the cell with water causing edema and the calcium being stimulated inside the cell, which will cause cell death. So those are the contributory factors to the cerebral edema that DKA patients have. Now let's move to the triad. We talked about hyperglycemia, that they will have hyperglycemia because they have this relative or, or, or absolute deficiency of insulin and therefore the glucose is unable to move into the cells. That's why they get hyperglycemic. Acidosis, the acidosis in these patients is usually caused by the ketones that are released from the fat break, breakdown. So we did say that when the glucose is unable to move into the cell, the body uses other means of energy by breaking down fat and muscle. So during that fat breakdown, there's release of e ketones that will then cause metabolic acidosis. The ketonuria and the glycosuria that they usually have, the, 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 the glucose, um, there's actually, the hyperglycemia actually exceeds the renal threshold for, 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 for absorption. So the kidneys are so overloaded by the glucose that some of it seeps through the urine. And the ketonuria, as we explained, because they have lots of ketones in the body and um, they have this catabolic state, state where, where fats are being broken down. So some of these ketones, they will seep through also into the urine and cause the ketonuria. So that explains now all the symptoms and possible signs that diabetic ketoacidosis patients will have. I hope that makes sense. DKA is classified according to the degree of the acidosis. So the more acidotic you are, the more severe is the DKA. So if you're going back to our patient, our patient had a bicarb of 3.8, so we can safely classify him as a severe DKA. And a moderate DKA pH is between 7.1 to 7.2 with a bicarb that is between 5 and 10. Mild DKA pH is 7.2 to 7.3 with a bicarb that is between 10 and 15. So there are triggers that have been found to, to, to actually trigger this patient into going um, into DKA and infection has been high on the list. So any kind of infection that this patient have, it can be gastro, it can be flu, it can be pneumonia, it can actually trigger them into going into DKA. So if you're looking at infection, infection is a stress to a child. So in a case of a stress, the body releases a stress hormone cortisol and cortisol is a counter-regulatory hormone of insulin. So it does the opposite of insulin or it will inhibit your insulin in these patients which are already deficient of, of insulin. That's So that's how infection can trigger these patients into going um, into DKA or any form of psychological stress can push these patients to get DKA. Lifestyle changes, what they eat and all can push them into DKA. Poor compliance to treatment. If this is a known type 1 diabetes who's not taking treatment properly or he doesn't understand yet how, how the insulin therapy works can actually trigger them to go into mm -hmm. DKA. How do we then manage these patients? So we start from the beginning with your ABC. Uh, make sure the airway is patent, the patient is breathing adequately, you assess your circulation and your vitals, and you assess for signs of shock. 
And if there is shock, you make sure to bolus the patient with 10 mils per kg of normal saline over 20 minutes. This can be repeated until 40 mils per kg. Then the next step is to start your fluid maintenance and insulin infusion. Bear that in mind that these two are usually started at the same time after you have fluidly resuscitated the patient. But I will explain them separately so that you guys don't get confused. So with your fluid requirement, we usually give the maintenance plus the deficit. This depends on the degree of the dehydration and acidosis of the patient. So what you do, you calculate your MRL, just like we've spoke about in the previous video, and whatever you get, you run it over 48 hours. Because as we have said, this is a hyperosmolar state, and therefore we want to stay away from running a risk of cerebral edema. The next question is, which fluid do we use? If you look at your EDL, it talks about the two-bag method. So we have two bags. One has got a dextrose-free 0.45 saline and one has got a 10% dextrose saline. So which one do you start with? This depends on the level of the HGT. If your HGT is more than 15 millimoles per liter, you only start the dextrose free saline bag and you do your hourly HGTs. The minute your hourly HGTs drop to between 10 to 15 millimoles per liter, then it's time for you to introduce the second bag. How do you introduce the second bag? So from the MRL that you have calculated over 48 hours, you give half of it as a dextrose-free saline and half of it as the 10% dextrose saline. Okay, and then you continue monitoring your HGTs hourly. The minute your HGT drops to less than 10, then you can safely stop the dextrose free saline bag and continue with the 10% dextrose saline bag. Okay. What is also important is that you must make sure to add KCL in these bags. It's usually liters of bags. So add 20 mils of KCL in each bag even if your potassium is normal. Because as we know that as we are shifting, as we are increasing the pH, the potassium is going to be shifted into the cells and these patients will tend to be hypokalemic. So that's why we're adding the KCL. If your patient is having a potassium that is slightly on the higher side, before you add the KCL on the bags, please do make sure that the patient is having a good urine output. Okay, that's it with the fluids. Now let's move to the insulin infusion. Remember I said this this is started usually immediately with your fluid maintenance. It, it is started on a separate IV line than the, the, than the fluid maintenance. What is the rate? The rate of the infusion is usually 0 .0 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 units per kg per hour. How do you get this? You take a 50 unit of insulin, you add it into a 50 mils of normal saline. Then that will give you a ratio of one unit is to one mil. Then if you want to start the patient on the 0 0.05 per kg per hour, let's say for example, our patient is weighing 20 kgs. So we're gonna say 0 0.05 times 20, which will give us one unit. Already from your mixture that we have done, you know that one unit is equivalent to one mil. So it means your insulin infusion in this patient who is 20 kg, if you want to give 0 0.05 units per kg, is going to run at one mil per hour. And then you watch your HGTs hourly and your urine dipsticks. If your HGT falls rapidly by more than five millimoles per hour or it goes down drastically in an hour to below 17, you make sure that you introduce your 10% dextrose saline and you do not stop the insulin infusion. And if the HGT drops to less than 5 millimoles, you still do not stop the insulin infusion, but you do make sure that you give a bolus of 2 mils per kg of 10% dextrose and you increase your dextrose saline solution even further. You can take it even up to 12.5%. You continue the IV insulin up until 
the base deficit is less than 5 or the bicarb is, is equal to or more than 15 or the pH is 7.3, that's number 1. Or you continue with the insulin infusion up until there is no ketonuria. You continue with the insulin infusion up until the HGTs are less or equal to 10 millimoles per liter. Then that's, that is how you can safely say your patient is out of DKA. Then the patient can be switched to the subcut insulin. Please make sure you do watch the next video as I tell you how.